Hello, my name is Yuni Villalonga. Um, I am the chief curator at the Coral Gables Museum, and it is an honor and a pleasure to have here today Imna Royo, uh, one of the artists participating in our current exhibition, um, Alien Nations 2020, an exhibition that is on view through March 14th, 2021 at the Coral Gables Museum. It's a show that I co-curated with Bartolome Bland. And um, this conversation is part of a series called The Nation I Inhabit with um, um, six artists where both um, Bartolome and I will be talking with the artists about their work. Imna, welcome. Um, I am very happy to have you here today because we have known each other for a long time. Actually, I, I met you when I was very young. You were already an artist and you were going to Cuba to work, to learn, um, and to teach as well. Um, but anyway, I'd like to start from your beginnings. How did you become an artist? I know you are from Guayama, Puerto Rico. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your beginnings and how did you make it to the US and to be where you are today? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and to have this conversation with you. It is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to uh, be able to see my artwork that I didn't have to hang it, hang it myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> I always travel with them and I install them. And this was like get, letting the baby go out. And I know that I could trust you. And I'm really Thank very you for happy. The baby then. <laughs> very happy. Oh, how do how how did the journey begin? Well. I, I begin in, uh, in Puerto Rico. My parents are from Guayama, the southern part of the island. It was uh, una central azucarera. There was an industry of sugar uh, in the early days. It's very colonial, quite beautiful. My family are, I come from a family of teachers. My grandmother was uh, a teacher. She taught uh, from elementary school to almost middle school in the countryside of the island. And she was one of the first black teachers that was certified to teach in the island. So I come from a very strong education oriented family and a family that is very much aware of who we were in terms of uh, uh, a family that was very mixed. Uh, my, my grandfather was a Spaniard uh, 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 reverend, you know, minister. So he married my my African grandmother, my grand my grand my African grandfather, uh, of African descent. Married my abuela Ramona, which was more or less a um, mixture of Spanish and Taina Indian, very much in, in the Criollo spirit. So there's always been an awareness of who we were as people and the components of the island. So giving that very fertile and diverse background and people of so many religions because religion will become, uh, spirituality will become uh, a guiding journey for me uh, uh, through the years from Pentecostal, very Catholic, Methodist, spiritualist people. So all that very much like we call in Puerto Rico, un sancocho sabroso, a very delicious food. It, it was not until around uh, going to high school that I become very interested in expressing myself creatively. And I recall passing by a house every, every day and hearing somebody playing the piano. And I came home and I asked my parents, can I take some piano lessons? And they look at me, you know, like she came out of another plan. They said, we can't we can afford to buy a piano. We are from a very, uh, we're from a working class family. So I said, okay, two weeks passed by and I passed by another, another balcony and I saw the poster saying that they were teaching, they was teaching how to draw. They were giving drawing classes and the classes, my sister just reminded me yesterday that for the sessions were like, you know, for the series of sessions were $20. 
I came home running. I said, oh, okay. And when I asked my parents, can I take drawing classes? And before they even asked, say anything, I said, and don't tell me that we cannot afford pencil and paper. And at that point, they actually said no. And it was my sister that I said, I, she had her first summer job. She said, I'll pay for them. And the second series, she reminded me that my grandfather paid for it. Wow. So she reminded me yesterday, he said, like, if it wasn't for us for, <laughs> to pay those first classes, maybe you have never would have become an artist. I would have continued wow. going down the list. You know, can I do this? Can I do that? We are a beautiful seed that if you have the right terrain, the right water, the right light, and the right care, we will just grow beautifully. So my, there, my sister helped to put the, you know, to plant that seed. And Don Francisco Delgado, which was the, my first drawing teacher, really put, put the light in it and uh, made it grow. From there, I was an honor student in, the, in high school. And I was, uh, as part of the program, I was able to take classes at the university. So I went to the University of Ponce, La Universidad de Santa Maria, to take some literature classes and drawing classes. So my first uh, training, uh, serious training as, a, as an adult after high school started in the School of Plastic Arts in San Juan. And it was a place that all the major Puerto Rican artists were teaching. Who Rafael, was there at the time? Rafael Tufino, uh, Lorenzo Mal has his uh, workshop right there. So we see this wonderful group of artists passing by your classroom, my classroom while I was drawing. I said, oh, isn't that this one? Isn't that Marine? <laughs> isn't that the other wow. one? Yeah. It was just an exciting, Tonio Maltore will pass by and all of those names will become familiar to us because we saw them around us. So uh, Jose, I studied with Jose Alicea, printmaking, and Susana Herrero as well. And um, after my first year or so, second, starting the second year, I, I decided to try life. I felt that as an artist at the time, I was so protected, I had not much to say. So I left one vacation and got, uh, got pregnant, got married, have another, got pregnant of another child, got divorced, got a job. And when I, all of those transitions happened, I came back to La Escuela de Artes Plásticas as a model. Because I, by then I was, I was taking care of two children, two kids, two daughters, beautiful daughters. I was uh, the only, I, was, I had to work to support them. And one day it occurred to me that as I'm sitting very still, doing my, you know, doing my modeling, I saw some students that were only drawing several parts of my body, but not my full body. And I went like, whoa. And I, I started walking around and I realized that I was in the wrong side of that equation. I should not be the model. I should be one of the people drawing because, you know, at the time I felt that I was, you know, I was a talented artist. So that made, that was a pivotal moment. I made that decision and I decided then uh, 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 to inquire there was, uh, you know, Puerto Rico is, has many programs from the United States. We are a colony of the United States. Therefore, there's, uh, you know, there's some, some the programs, the uh, American programs available. Among those programs were the uh, some scholarships of the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And many students in my school was having those, uh, those scholarships. And I asked, how do you get that? And they explain, and I said, okay. And I asked as a phone, uh, uh, working in the phone company, I helped, it just happened to help the, the psychiatrist that was part of that program to do his phone calls to the Dominican Republic. And he was very supportive of my application. Wow. So in the middle of all that, my mother died. And I'm taking care of two kids without the support of my mother. And at that point, I asked the counselor, can this scholarship could be transferred to the United States? And she said, yes. 
Wow. And the moment she said that, I went running to uh, Lorenzo Mal and I asked him if, you know, if I if I have an opportunity to study in the United States, which place would you recommend? And he said, Pratt Institute. So wow. that's how I finished in New York and I entered into Pratt Institute, where we lived in New York for four, three or four years. Then from there, I got a scholarship to go to Yale University where I did my master's. And that's how I, fin I have stayed in Connecticut all of these years. Since then, how, how old were you when, you when you arrived to Connecticut then? Very young. I graduated from Yale at 77, 1977. Oh. And in two days, I will be 70 years old. Wow. The, could you find the job as an artist after graduating from Yale? What did you do? Um, how was life then in, in Connecticut? Um, you were an immigrant with two kids, um, just graduated. Well, in New Haven, uh, one of the things that is very interesting in New Haven is that there is a lot of Yale graduates looking for jobs at the same time you're looking for a job. So it, uh, it took uh, several years to get a, to land a job in higher education because usually the practice is you get any job and you go around the nation to get any post to start teaching because you need experience. But given the fact that I had two, ki two kids and they were in school, they were stable, they were happy, I didn't want it to uproot them. So it took me almost 10 years, but my, when I finally got a, landed a job, I landed in a job at uh, South Central Community College where I was the only art teacher there. So I was able to shape the program. I taught drawing, I taught painting and art history. And among the courses that I initiated was uh, teaching uh, women, women in the arts because I felt that that was, uh, that was a vacuum, that was something that was missing. And I integrated two artists from around the world. So I really wanted to see myself included. So I will, I will bring in artists from Puerto Rico, you know, teach about my, you know, my own heritage, my own canon, the canon in which I belong. So that consciousness started there very early. Can you talk more about this um, connection to women in your work? Um, uh, specifically, I'm interested um, in your relationship with the Women's Caucus. Can you tell us more about this? Sure. My, um, the evolution of my work have been from when I was in Puerto Rico, I was very much concerned with issues of Puerto Rico. When I went to Pratt Institute, I was interested in motion. Abstract expressionism was my interest at the time. When I came to Yale, then I start then uh, dealing with me, you know, I have to deal with my life as a single parent going into very competitive school then suddenly I am very much focused in my being as my role as a woman. And in this case, as a women artist, because as when you look at the, uh, at the museums, the Yale Art Gallery at the time, there was very little representation of women artists. And I started looking at Kathy Kowitz, or oh, any women, <laughs> women I artists that were available, I was just devouring them because I needed that mirror at that time. Uh, and so when I leave school, I started, I, my work continued to be an exploration of my inner self as a woman in the society. If you see the works that are behind me were call, are called Rompiendo la Maya, Breaking the Net. It's about uh, human potential, women's potential. If we can only a break all those obstacles that we have. Like I said in the beginning, we can grow beautifully, but my God, we're tied with so many things that that makes it, that makes the journey very difficult. You have to most of the time it's like breaking through different things. And in the, uh, in work, uh, when I discovered the Women Caucus, I was teaching in San Juan College, and I was invited for a conference. 
uh, I present what I was teaching in my classroom dealing with women, you know, art and women's arts and women's perspective and a feminist perspective in art. So that was my first introduction to them in 1991. So I get inv I got involved in the caucus, the, um, in the women's caucus, they have many other sub caucuses and one was the women of color caucus. I found a group of women that were a a Asian Pacific, they were La Chicanas, they were the African American artists, and suddenly I found a home. I found a place that women had a voice and were supported each other, were supporting each other. I moved into becoming the uh, second, uh, the second vice president, and later uh, became president of the national organization as well. In the trip to China, I we went to the women's uh, uh, conference, in which we saw women from all over the world, and uh, dealing with all their struggles and whatnot. But in we did a tour, and we went to Xiong you know, the places where they have the warriors that were buried. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, that trip later influenced, although influenced up, up to a certain degree, those pieces that you're seeing over there, those heads are part of the same mold that I made the ancestors of the passage in clay. And all of that information later, years later, just moved into those pieces. But it was that trip with the Women's Caucus that brought me. In your work and in your formation, it is very important, an early trip that you made to Ghana. Can you tell us a little bit more about the trip and what it meant for you? In 1997, I traveled for the first time to Ghana and it was a pivotal uh, trip for me because it was, I visited uh, Elmina and uh, Cape Coast and Elmina. Those are the castles that they used to bring in the captured people that were taken to bring them into the Americas. And being in the physical space changes everything. It, or it changed to me because, you know, we read the history, but it's not the same as being in that, those quarters in which you understand physically that it was small spaces, there were hundreds of people in those spaces, there were, the air wasn't flowing. And you know that there was blood and all kinds of things in those spaces. And when the guide said, and this is the door of no return, something from the deepest part of my soul said, no, we return. And another, another, a man was passing by and he was a man of African descent, English of his accent and he said yes we do and at that moment i realized that time and space is circular it is it's a continuum that i was part of that and we survive we're here we are part of that experience so my consciousness about from where I come from, the deepest part of my soul, where my connection with the ancestors started at that moment. Wow. Did you ever return to Ghana? Yes, I did a second trip. And, and the second trip I went to, I was invited to a Pana Fest uh, where there was a festival that people come from all over Africa to exchange. And my friend Barbara Mollet was invited with her theater, pro, uh, theater presentation and I brought in my son and my husband, and we stayed for almost a month or six weeks. And wow. it was a fantastic experience. Then later I traveled to 10 years later, I went to Nigeria and I visited Oshobo. I visited the shrine of Oshun and it was a phenomenal trip because at that trip, I went to Ido Osun kingdom and the king over there the king at the time he it was his 50th birthday and he said to me that uh they were not they were not accepting any visitors because the village was taking you know were preparing for his uh birthday 
And he said, because it was his birthday, he was going to do something very special for me. And what he did was they sat me in a chair and then suddenly I start seeing the elders coming in. And at some point they started doing libation in the ground and praying for me. And I had someone telling me in English what was happening. And what they were doing was welcoming my ancestors back, welcoming, welcoming wow. me back into the homeland, so to speak. And they were not only praying for me and the, my ancestors, they were praying for those that are yet to be born. Because in Yoruba wow. belief, you nice. are dealing with se seven, seven generations before, seven generations after you. And that truly blew my mind that this is, consequential, that we are dealing in space and time and back and front, and we have to be responsible for, because they already laid our grounds where we're standing on and we have to move it forward, but we have to prepare the terrain for those that are yet to be born. That is something, Imna, that uh, brings me to this piece that we have in the show. Absolutely. We're talking about that heritage and that journey from Africa to the new world um, of the, all these deities mm -hmm. along with the people who came. And not only because of that and because of the content, but also um, the technique and the, the, the symbols that you use in the piece also came probably from those experiences in Africa. That piece was inspired by the journey of the, the ancestors. It began with a woodcut, a series of woodcuts uh, in the, on paper that later after my trip to Africa, I printed them in satin and framed them with adinkra, uh, with kente and adinkra fabric. Then once that piece was done, I really had a tremendous need to have them seen two-dimensionally and work, uh, I worked in a mold and I was, I'm a paper maker. I work with cotton fiber and, and abaca fiber and I made the, I casted those, the, the figures with cotton fiber. The Adinkra symbols are are printed separately in rice paper, and then they are applique on the mold as I'm putting all the, 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 the wet paper that it will all dry as one. And I interlace some of the uh, kente cloth that had the adrinca, I cut it, and I, then in between are interlaced with that fabric. And once the pieces were done, I really wanted to have extensions and I really wanted them to look like deities that be just bigger than life. So that was the way in which I started doing the milagros to create that extensions in which they are ephemeral. They are, you know, I didn't want them solid. And it is a piece that when the air hits it, it's really is mobile, it moves. It's very dynamic that way. And the boats are the cargo, are us coming through that space and having an understanding that people, that the people were protected and continues to be uh, guided and protected to this day, bringing all their, their belief systems, their legacy, uh, you know, the legacy of, uh, of the heritage. So interesting that you kept the connection with Puerto Rico, but you also went to Cuba. You started traveling um, to Cuba, and um, at the time when I when we met, I could see you, um, as I was saying, not only teaching and you know um, sharing new techniques like encaustic at the Taller de Arte Gráficas, but also learning and and creating you know a community with other printmakers um can you tell me about that experience okay 
you also invited, you know, throughout the years, you brought a lot of Cuban artists to Connecticut and to your school um, at Eastern Connecticut University later. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about those trips and that connection with the Caribbean? Well, what brings me to Cuba is a, a, a wonderful journey because what brings me to Cuba starts with uh, themes of my artwork that I was starting to, it was starting to emerge. I was invited for an exhibition by Gail Tremblay and uh, Lillian Pitt, both Native Americans uh, from Olympia, Washington. And our job was to be part of, uh, uh, of um, an art festival in Tabor. Uh, and um, our job was to bring new technologies, old technologies, and water. And our point of view as artists dealing with, as art, you know, as water protectors, what was going on with the water, what was going on with the salmon, and many species of salmon was dying. So as part of our statements, uh, our, our, oh, our artwork, what I did was I started to look for deities of water that related to me, you know, and I started looking at the Taino uh, deity of water, which is Atabeira, wanted to get a Mexican one and so on. And I just happened to find a book by Lidia, Lidia Cabreras that was called Gemaya and Oshun. The moment I opened that book, I saw Gemaya and I never left. And I still working with Orisha work, Orisha <laughs> representation, because it was so rich that I made a, uh, an art, an installation called the many, los muchos caminos de Yemaya, the many paths of Yemaya, which was I, for the first time I introduced multimedia into it. For those who don't know who Yemaya is, can you tell us who she is? Yemaya is the goddess of the of the waters. Yemaya is the ocean, is the sea. It is a locum, part of a locum, which is the bottom of the sea. It is where all life emerges. From there, you can have trees. Without water, you cannot have a lot of things. So we cannot be, and we cannot exist. But she is the deity that pure creativity in which we all emerge from. And that was so grand and so beautiful. And the imagery was phenomenal for me. It was so rich. Sometimes as an artist, you're sitting in your studio going, oh my God, what am I gonna paint now about? I saw that landscape, I saw that uh, still life. What else am I gonna talk about? Yes, I'm, you know, there's the politics, there's this, but suddenly when you go to a well that is so deep and rich, and you start to just washing your face and drinking from it, and is constantly giving, it's hard to go away from it. So I believe that I just been enriched by that, exp that, that experience changed a great deal, changed my life in many ways. I have a show in Puerto Rico and Humberto Figueroa, fabulous curator, he's everything, you know, he's a wonderful art professional and artist. And he said, you're going to Cuba? Why don't you take one of those? You put it in your, because everything was printed by, in fabric. You know, take one of those. And I arrived to Cuba with a group of my students from my university. I brought my, I brought one, uh, two examples of my work. And when I, uh, I was told go to see the Ca Museo Casa Africa. And so I did. And people were leaving for lunch. And I took one of the pieces out in the street and one of the specialists recognized the batik material that I have framed those work. And she said, don't go anywhere. And from them on on, I started exhibiting with them every single year. And it was, and I was participating in the conference that they have about anthropology and African heritage. And have it, uh, an African heritage. So I was a participant and started doing workshops in Cuba at the Taller Experimental de la Grafica, and I started getting yeah. engaged more with the spiritual elements that were that were uh, expressed in Cuba. 
because when I had that show about Jemaya in, uh, in La Casa Guayasamil, I realized that every single person that came to attend the show, they were telling me more about my work that I actually knew about. And that really uh, caught my curiosity. I became more, uh, I became immersed in the theme. But this was not the first time that I got interested in, in African art or, uh, you know, or in my own heritage. When I was at Yale, I took a, I took a course with uh, Ferris Thompson. And with Thompson, he really, he was a great investigator of uh, African art, African spirituality, and how it deals with modern culture and how you see the ramifications in African-American art, expressions, hip hop, the whole world. And I saw my family, uh, I find, I discovered those connections through the class that there's some of those expressions are, were latent in our gestures and our speech in all of those things that uh, he, he, uh, he, it, it is in that class that I, I, I have like an awakening of being more conscious about my cultural background. So it was with him, it was in that class that first awakening there and then the journey continues through, the, through, through traveling. I can see that there is an array of uh, backgrounds and references in, in your formation, your technical formation. Can you talk about, um, you know, all these influences um, that come, you know, starting from um, the Puerto Rican school of filmmaking that is very important to all these trips and, and, mm -hmm. and professors that you've had? Puerto, Puerto Rican art is very strong. Uh, printmaking in Puerto Rico is a very important art form. Uh, Puerto Rican printmakers are famous for not only their technique, but the expression and so on. And I studied in Puerto Rico con Jose Alicea, which is a giant on Puerto Rican printmaking and very much influenced by seeing Don Lorenzo Mal working in his studio at La Escuela de Artes Plástica and, uh, Lord, uh, and Antonio Maltorell and many other printmakers. So when I left the island, I was a very proud Puerto Rican artist with a strong tradition in printmaking. And uh, as a lot of our artists from Puerto Rico also studied in, in Mexico, and Mexico has been renowned for his graphics as well. So I was standing in very strong shoulders right there. When I come to the United States, so I realized that American uh, printmaking is influenced by German expressionism and by a great deal of Japanese printmaking as well. So, so I just submerged myself in that, in that um, tradition and understanding that uh, the uh, Japanese art is a Japanese printmaking is an important um, type to printmaking. I really wanted to learn more directly, and I found Francisco Patlan in uh, Guanajuato, Mexico, that he spent, uh, I think it was almost two years in Japan learning Japanese techniques. So I spent a summer with him uh, learning to work with. Um, water-based inks, basically using pigments and, uh, and gum arabic and using different plates, uh, wood woodcuts, and then on top of it, he will put an intaglio on top, of, uh, a, um, a mesotint, and he created the most beautiful, delicate, but intense type of prints. So I was, uh, I was very uh, fortunate to have a one-on-one -on -one with him one summer working in those techniques. So for me, I use all of it. Depends on my idea, depends of what's the concept I'm developing. I just have an array of uh, techniques on hand that allows me to 
you know, weave all this knowledge into the work that I'm doing at the time. Yes, definitely. And most importantly, most of the time, it's not left in a two-dimensional format, but you also create volumes and, you know, um, intervene spaces, create installations. Is this something that interested you since the beginning of your work? Uh, trying to get out of the picture plane is something that I always wanted. It seems to be, it's a, a more, if I, I look at it as more of an emotional need from the pieces of breaking the net, moving from the net, it's always breaking out of that picture plane and occupying space. I love doing the installations because the audience become part of the pieces themselves. They interact with that space. I mentioned before that I was very much interested in dance, in motion, in movement. So that adds that element to my work that is not static. So for me, it's important that things move. Everything in life moves. <laughs> You know, you can't stand still. Time moves. So it's that element of motion that, that we share in our everyday life. I see it in my work as well. Uh, what is it that I'm doing now? Uh, I retired a couple of years ago and uh, from after a long career in teaching. I taught, uh, as I mentioned before, in a community college. Then I moved to a four-year college where I was the head of the printmaking program, set up a state-of-the-art printmaking shop before I left. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that uh, some other, some, somebody else other than me is enjoying some really in the one, in the beautiful setup, uh, setup uh, workshop. Um, in given the pandemic right at this moment, I've been doing more work in terms of internalizing what's going on, what to express. I've been more really engaged more in meditation and quietness, how to be quiet at this moment, because it seems to demand that reverence. It seems to, I think ever since Irma, the hurricane Irma, Maria, uh, the terremotos in the island, uh, the many people, the pandemia that is as many people are losing their lives right at this moment. So it's, it's been very hard to figure out where to go from here in the sense that this time, this, this is a very unique time and it demands the artist to race to the occasion. And at this moment, I am very much in contemplation and figuring out what is it, what is the body, it, the body is processing. But having said that, uh, this, this time have reminded me of those experiences in El Nina. This time has reminded me that there's a continuum and we are, we are in a place in which two realities are meeting. In particular, when I saw what happened to uh, George Floyd that opened up that space again for me, that there was a connection between the consequences of a history that and hinders some uh, violence mm -hmm. right now and how many people in this society have been living with that violence and then suddenly it was visible to all of us. I saw in yeah, many communities saw that connection uh, that goes back to the ancestors because there's been 400 years of oppression, aggression, and suddenly that was in this, for me, it connected. For me, it connected when he called his mother. At that point in time, I felt just like I was standing in the door of no return in which his voice really went 
through time and space and actually got to his mother and many other mothers on the other side. And suddenly you see all, all the things that were happening in the streets, the protest, all of that energy was connected. And as an artist, uh, uh, how do you bring, how do you, how do you articulate that? And I'm in that process of, like they say in my, like they say, uh, we are at this moment pregnant. We are right now, everything is like the belly is getting big and we're ready to birth. And we need to birth a new reality, a new way of seeing, a new way of being. So as the... Um, Amanda Gorman just said a couple of days ago, we have to step to our history. And then we have to always figure out from that history, how do you bring it in and become the light and have the courage to look at it and move forward. I don't think it's gonna be, it's gonna take the same format as before because we're still in a pandemic. We're still, you know, uh, we're doing a great deal. We open up new technologies to, to express what we're doing right now. For example, a lot of exhibitions are being done virtually because people are not being able to come to the museums. Artists are doing things on their own with the technology, especially young people that are very apt in that transformation and reinventing themselves. So I find the terrain, the creative terrain to be very, very fertile. I see a lot of collaborations. In the past, I have done many works in collaborations uh, if, when I was uh, you know, with my colleagues at the university. So the, the young people have all those things very readily at their hand. So do, I, do yes. Do you foresee uh, changes in your own work? What are you, what are you? Engendering now. Ah, the, yes, I am in the process at this moment. Estoy, estoy en este momento con toda premise. But one of the things, you know, uh, while you are work, trying to get a new vision or how your vision connects to your time, that you can rise to your time, while you're doing that, there's a lot of unfinished business when you are with, when you're an artist that is 70 years old, which in two days I will be. So it forces you not to look back, because, but not to stay back, but at 70, it's only so much forward that you have. What are you interested in now? What are you doing? Before the pandemic, I was working in, um, in an exhibition that encompassed my body of my, you know, my full body of work, of my work of over 40 years. So I'm working with uh, Yolanda Wood, Humberto Figueroa, and Benjamin Ortiz. The, the exhibition was, is, was going to open in, Port, in, uh, in New York and in Puerto Rico. And, and I'm at the moment working in the, um, in the catalog. So that's one part of the things that I'm working on is to basically organize and see my work with a different perspective and somebody else's perspective, which is important for an artist. The other part, because you can, uh, I do very large prints, I go to other places to make work because of the pandemic, I can't do that. And I'm, so I'm working in my studio, I have my own press, so I'm working in smaller things. But in the smaller things, since I'm always doing larger things, it's really, I'm starting to truly enjoy the activity of being alone and doing smaller things, precious things. So I, um, I, uh, in my last pieces, I did two pieces for the um, El Museo, La Libreria Museo Casa del Libro in which the pieces are assemblages combining a choreography and uh, pieces that move inside of the print. And that's new for me, because those are smaller sculptures, so smaller three-dimensional things with ready-mades, and I'm having fun. It is a little house, and then it has uh, 
uh, it has prints, a print that comes down uh, ahead. Uh, the, the piece, the theme was isolation. Mm -hmm. How are we doing as artists in isolation? And my piece is called Messages from the, uh, uh, from the Ancestors. The Mensajes del Ultramundo. And basically, uh, I, I, I made a piece that looks like me and it moves like a cutout, you know, like I do things like that, little cutouts. Mm -hmm. And I'm there and I can move myself inside of the house because part of the isolation, you're isolated in your own house. But that's relative because my house is open. So you can feel overwhelmed or you can see, feel opened. You know, you could be, you know, you could be overwhelmed with your circumstance and the ancestors were overwhelmed with their circumstance but one of the message of the inframundo of the ancestors is that we have the tools to overcome we have the tools that they have given us you know the creativity the ashe the spark of life all these wonderful things and remedies that they left behind us, that we can use it. That's a beautiful um, message, Imna. Um, I think to, to end this conversation, uh, and um, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing all this wealth of knowledge and for opening um, your heart and um, your creativity and your wisdom to, to us. Um, we love your piece. Everybody has loved your piece in the show. And this is a great opportunity to understand it a little better, to put it in context. Um, I hope you had enjoyed it. You have enjoyed it too. Um, again, thank you so much. Oh, I wanna thank you for let you know, for inviting me and to participate in such a beautiful exhibit with such wonderful artists. Muchas gracias.